Part two of three of the second series of talks on biodiversity at John Abbott College by Oliver Hillel, Program Officer of the Secretariat of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. The tyranny of fibers, all of those soil fertility. I think just, you know, for, for me here, what I wanted to mention is more the beauty and the wonder of nature. I, I invite you to imagine uh, being in a rainforest on a coral reef. Why do I say those two? Because those two are the most diverse food system on the earth. So when you're in there, honestly, I feel almost mystical. Because what you see around you is, is just, you know, it's, it takes um, a scientist who does not believe that God has to have created all that, has a hard time in those moments. Because to see all that and imagine that just this comes out of chance, it's difficult. It's defensible, and scientifically, I have to say, it's possible. But you wonder, and that's what we want. Now, where do we stand in the Convention on Biological Diversity? We're not in a good situation either. There is a big discussion right now we're going to have in about two weeks' time. We're going to have a big conference, 7,000 people with 193 governments coming together and discussing what's going to happen on biodiversity at the global level over the next two years and 10 years. They have a strategic plan for 10 years. But there's a big problem, we don't have money. That's what we're hearing from every country. So, it's a problem. Everyone wants access and benefit sharing, which means that if you're eating uh, something, that something has whatever food you, you choose, which is all biological, of course, has a source. And that source of the, of the variability of those, of those animals and plants that we have has to be protected. So the idea is that any money that you make out of biodiversity, you should reserve a little bit of money to keep the biodiversity alive. That's what's called access and benefit share. So some countries would like to go to, say, Peru, and from Peru, learn what can be done with biodiversity in Peru. But of course, Peru has to say, well, wait a second, if you're going to make money on it, you're going to make money in Peru. You need the money to protect the biodiversity from which you eat it. That's what the issue is, as you can imagine. That's a pretty good discussion. It's, uh, in principle, everyone agrees, but in, when it comes to the details, there's a lot of appeal for discussion. And I've talked about the budgets. Basically, all these countries have come together in, you know, and said, this is what we want to do over the next 10 years on biodiversity. And then, when developing countries hear that developed countries say, yes, we would all love to do that, but we don't have any money, then they basically, what they, the developing countries said is, well, then we don't have a strategic plan. Oh, no, we can't do that. We have to have a strategic plan. Well, then we cough up the money. Well, you've got to do your part too. Yeah, you do. Well, yeah. So that is the discussion that's going on. It's all about power and money. And I put horse trading because, unfortunately, that happens a lot. You know, there are issues, and I give you a few examples. There's one plan on South-South cooperation that I'm helping negotiate in the convention. South-South cooperation means support between developing countries, because very often the technologies for solution in India can be found in Pakistan more than in the United States. Or the solution for a problem in, in any island in the Pacific can be found in another island in the Pacific rather than in a large continental and developed country. So the idea is to do South-South cooperation, but of course that is a sensitive issue. So some countries are saying we want that plan, others are saying, well, that's actually a bit threatening because we're used to sitting down with a very poor country and telling that very poor country what we want to see done. And the, and the poor country gets what? Accepts. And then we put that agenda down there right as it is, which is very effective and it's called North-South cooperation. But sometimes it is a bit impossible in the sense that whoever has the money in this equation has more power than what it should be discussed. So South-South cooperation is an effort to try to undo that, but many countries will not agree with that. So what they do is then they take another issue that they favor, and they tell you as a country, okay, I'm going to be able to go along with that one, and in compensation, you help me on that other issue that's pure horse, horse trading, and that's what happens. This is the point with all that, is to say, it's not enough. What we're facing is so serious that what I would like to discuss with you guys here today is a personal revolution. We need to change the way we do our stuff, each one of us. There's no other way to do it. I'm 
even considering I'm resilient, I'm considering giving up me, because the impact of making me all the time is not nice to look at, particularly the way we're producing meats today, particularly the way this is happening as we speak. I mean, I was in the Amazon like maybe six months ago, and I was seeing how cattle ranching farms are eaten wide into the Amazon rainforest, and soya plantation against do you know what most of the soya production of Brazil is used for? To feed cattle. So when you see all those huge soya plantations and all those cattle ranching, you say, my God, maybe I should eat a little bit less of it, not give it up altogether. But that's what I mean by personal revolution. The change is not quick enough through the politics. We have to walk the walk. And I remember this, um, I was lucky enough to live a few years in the Philippines and they had the people power revolution. When I started talking to my Filipino friends about personal revolution, they started talking to me about you feel the pitch. And then what what does that mean? Well, if you're into a revolution, you have to feel the pitch. That means you have to change, because change won't happen without feeling the pitch. So basically what I'm saying is here, what could we do as educators to walk the talk and feel the pitch that we can live with? You know, but still, if we don't feel the pitch, maybe we're not doing enough. Fed feet in the mud, heads in the bottom, and, and what I'm thinking is personal and professional uh, commitment towards sustainability. You know, there's so many aspects of this. And it's very clear to us in the Secretary that biodiversity is just the flagship. Behind biodiversity is just the more sustainable way of life. So, how can we achieve that? First, I like this um, British writer called Oscar Wilde, and he was very good with words. Uh, he had a, a way with words, and one of the things he always said, and what I thought was interesting, is that education is a wonderful thing, but everything that is worth learning cannot be taught. That was his, his way of, of saying that, and I think he was right. But there's a way out, and that way out is to not teach, but to promote learning, because that's what really works, is, is people learning their own way through that and applying what they're thinking uh, in a hands-on and engaged way and facilitate learning. So I guess our role, when, when I say our, we're, I'm talking about educators and if you took the trouble, even you guys from high school or from wherever you come, if you took the trouble to take the time to hear, that means that you're more than just an observer of this, that means that you care. If you do care, you also have to become an educator in the sense to facilitate other people to learn about it, and yourself as well. So, here are a couple of ideas on how that could happen. Uh, first, I want to talk about the idea of, of nation action, which I've been familiar with, uh, and, and that has had uh, a very hands-on approach. It's pretty much what we talk about. It's getting people out in the field, confronted with the issues related to biodiversity, and doing something about that. And I like that. So, the partnership with the Environmental Assessment and Integrated Water Resource Management is a good example of what's happening in terms of nature connection. As is, and here I want to say, the parties to the convention are discussing how cities and local authorities can help national governments implement the convention. For that, they needed a measurement state, which is the so-called CBI, City Biodiversity Index. It's a way to measure biodiversity in cities, because as you know, more than 50% of the population nowadays lives in cities. Nature Connection is assisting the city of Montreal to measure the biodiversity in Montreal because that's what Montreal needs to report on. What are they doing about their own biodiversity? So this is another example of something that is concrete and that happens. I also wanted to mention something that in the past, hey, maybe I'm, I'm wearing a suit now, but you can imagine me doing a action for Greenpeace against nuclear energy in the Bay of Guanabara. So I, I was once a, a green Greenpeace activist. I had my phone number and the phone number of my lawyer tattooed on my skin so that I could if I had been arrested. Um, and it didn't happen. But one of the things we, that they propose, and I think it's brilliant, is a team of people in a, in, a, in a, it's a kit, it's an education kit, and it goes with, you divide your class in three. One will do research, one will do advocacy, and the third will do media. So the research team will decide what is relevant to me? What am I concerned about? What is bothering me about this? In biodiversity or something else? That's a biodiversity. The advocacy team will say, 
Well, it's not a neutral issue. We have to have a position about that. We have to take sides. And this is also one of the things that lately has become, uh, particularly on biodiversity, this idea of academic distancing, this idea of iron power from which you look and observe. We don't have time for that, guys. We need faculty and researchers engaged. We need to put them right in the middle of the problem. So let's do advocacy. Let's imagine what, what is it that we're trying to change. This is what the advocacy team does. And then there's a media group as well that looks, who can we talk to? How can we get the word out? Do we do a demonstration? Do we tie ourselves to a tree? Do we go be the, the harpoon and the, and the whale? Which is what Greenpeace did and, and many others do as well very well. I like that idea. And I'd like to encourage you as learners and as educators to imagine ways that we can do that, that we can start having a goal at that. Your few thoughts on that, on, on further on that, so that we can start our discussion. The first would be, obviously, it's cross-cutting. Biodiversity, please don't put it only in biology or in biological sciences. It goes across its economics. It's whatever you want, it's in. It has to be looked at as a whole thing. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't really make uh, any sense to say, okay, no, no, biodiversity is covered now. We go, it's in there in biology. Uh, no, it's not going to work. You know? So how do we do that? I like the idea of days. The 22nd of May every year is the International Day of Biodiversity, but we could use any other. Celebrate that because I think the fact that you choose a day makes it much easier for people to collaborate. And, and I've heard some, some examples right here from what McGill and, and, and John Abbott do to celebrate a few days. So I, I think that's a great idea. Do get involved in the international processes because what you do locally, and we all know the, the thing globally and at local, locally, what you do locally affects what happens up there. So I, I was kind of saying, push politicians and corporations. I am doing that all the time. Do the lobbying. We can't do that. The idea is to make biodiversity relevant to people's needs and expectations. That's so easy, you know. I, I uh, when when I teach about that, one of the things I, if I have time, I would like, what what do you do? What do you want to do in life? What is your next project? And then try to find out how biodiversity can be part of that. You know, how can we make it part of your professional life? And that's what I think is another goal. Whatever, whatever on earth you do, if you're a band manager, if you work in IT, if you work with music and dance in the Cirque du Soleil, if you work in the UN, if you work in a, in a college or teaching, whatever, you can do a lot. And that's what I think is so, so great about that, because it's just a question of finding how do you do that to make the thing relevant to the person. So if the person says, all I want to do is to make money, there are many ways to make money as well, trying to protect biodiversity, why not? So try to choose a way that protects or that involves protecting Earth, protecting our the power of life on Earth to give us what we need. So that's the idea there. And very clearly, we spend a lot of money, and we earn that money in a hard way. How can we spend every cent in a way that makes sense to the walking the talk idea? You know, I am that client. That when go goes to a hotel and makes a reservation, I ask the guy, do you have an environmental strategy, sir? And the guy's a salesperson, right? So he said, what? Yeah, well, environment, do you do anything like, oh, I've got to find, what is that environmental BP that we have somewhere or that? And then they put me in touch with that person, which is good. But at least I show him I care, and he will next time, he will know the name and maybe the extension of that manager. So the next time around, it's going to be easier. And maybe if he gets four calls like this, the next sales pitch he has, he says, well, you know what, guys, do tell me about this whole thing. What are we doing for corporate social responsibility? Because he has to me on that. You know? I had many salespersons in the tourism industry tell me that the best sales pitch you can have is that your company makes a difference. And I, I've seen that very effectively used. End of part two of three of the second series of talks on biodiversity at John Abbott College by Oliver Hillel, Program Officer of the Secretariat of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Part 3 follows.